welcome to the Atheist Experience. We're broadcasting live this Sunday, January 14th, 2018. And I'm your host, Tracy Harris. And with me this week is a special guest, Eric Murphy. Hi. Hey. Um, let's see. So Atheist Experience is a production of the Atheist Community of Austin, a Texas nonprofit educational organization dedicated to the separation of government and religion and the promotion of positive atheist culture. And that's the... The now, I guess, brief announcements that we're used to, because the other ones show up on screen, and I also, you know, I'll put some lo helpful links at the blog sometimes on the shows that I host. But uh, let's see. Let's introduce you to people who might not recognize you, might not know who you are. Okay. You are uh, hosting one of the newer products that has been put out for media outreach um, by the Atheist Community of Austin. It's the show Talk Heathen. Yes. Well, actually, I'm a co-host. Uh, my co-host is Jamie, and he's amazing, and he's here. Hi, Jamie. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. We started Talk Heathen um, toward the end of last year, and we really, really love, I mean, we're fans of the Atheist Experience, and we wanted to do something similar, but we had those times where we, you know, we, we'd hear a call, and then as a fan, you're like, "What happened? Like, what happened to that person?" I kind of want to, I want to know, and you never do. And we try and keep in touch with those people, and we try and draw out the conversation just a little bit longer, so that um, people who are hearing the argument—I mean, for you and I, huh. and a lot of fans, it's it's old hat. I mean, you hear the argument over and over again, but. It's new for a lot of people too. You know, a lot of people are tuning in, and this is some one of the first places that they see in their process of deconversion. And so we try and stretch that out just a little bit, so they can see a little bit more of the inner workings of that. Um, but other than that, like, yeah, it's about it. <laughs> okay. Well, no, that's um, good. Yeah. And when did you say it airs? It's every Sunday before this show. It's from 1 o'clock to 2 in the afternoon, uh, okay. Central Time. Okay. Uh, we stream live, and people are welcome to participate in the live chat. If, okay. Uh, and then, obviously, you can look it up on YouTube. Right, afterwards. it's archived. I've seen the shows on archives, so that's good. And I think you even had, like, Matt come on, because you, uh, you needed a, a fill-in. He came in to help <laughs> sub. <laughs> yeah. So that was kind of fun. It, it is. Um, I went out to go visit family, and um, when poor Jamie, uh, he was on with Matt, and I called in. I faked my name, and I managed to get through. And uh, as soon as I went, got on the air, I said, "This is Eric. Jamie has me trapped in his basement." And, oh. and Jamie clicks it and turns it off, and so we're we're, we're just clearly <laughs> that's just a prank. <laughs> yeah, and Matt goes, "Yeah, I tackled Next him and color. helped." And helped yeah. him. So, <laughs> It was, um, it, it's, it's fun, we've been <laughs> playing with that, but oh, that's uh, cute. Okay. Matt, Matt really did, he helped step in when I couldn't be there, and then the next weekend, turned out that Jamie had something, and yeah, yeah. Matt stepped in, so. Um, oh, fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do we have any topics or anything? I probably, I'm assuming not, since you kind of um, stepped in to help us, and we're subbing because we, we lost Phil this week. Not yeah. lost forever, but just he couldn't make it this week, and so we we switched and swapped a little, juggled some people, and, and got you on. So it's not like you were expecting this, and no. we're saying, yes, I've prepared a topic. Let me pull my notes. Right? <laughs> so, no. Um, okay. But it's, I'm, just, I'm just excited to be here, and I'm excited that... Uh, uh, the ACA um, has given me the opportunity, and I get to meet cool people like you and Phil, and be here today. So, okay, well, great. I'm, I'm I'm ready. All right, then I guess we're gonna start the call. All right. Let's see what we've got going on here. We do have a pretty good mix today, and we'll go ahead and we'll try Mark. And so, hey, is this Mark from Toronto? Yeah, it's Mark from Toronto. Tracy, how's it going? Good. So you're on with Tracy and Eric this week. Hey, Mark. Hey, Eric. How's it going? <laughs> Good. What do you got for us? Um. All right. Um. Do you remember talking to me back when Anthony was on, Tracy? Uh, I. It might come back to me the the more we chat. <laughs> but but go on. I mean, if you feel like you want to give like a, a couple of lines of summary, feel free. Otherwise, you can jump into your topic as is. Whatever you want. Okay. Um, well, I basically called and I was saying that I more or less take the opposite um, opposite view of uh, atheism. I don't 
where atheists don't see enough evidence to convince them that there's such a thing as God. I don't see enough evidence to convince me that the universe could have come into existence without the need of a creative being. And that's what we sort of talked about. We went around talking about talking about that. So what would be what would be evidence for you of, of something that would uh, be a natural universal outcome? Um, well, that's, <laughs> that's the thing. That's that. Yeah, that was like, what evidence do you expect to see that you don't see? I don't know. That's what I'm saying. Like I got anybody, any of my, so you don't see that, evidence of a natural universe, but you don't know what the evidence would be that you'd expect to see for a natural universe. Well, that's what I'm getting to. Like my, anybody that, any of my friends and family that know me, they know I have a very big, huge imagination. I always get accused of having a, overactive imagination and I can't even rack my imagination and imagine how the universe could have come into existence without some kind of higher intelligent creative being that brought it into existence. I, I just can't see how that could be possible. Okay, do you see evidence of a being that creates universes? Okay, without appealing to a personal life experience, what um, personal yeah. life experience you do without appealing to a personal life experience you're saying that you do see evidence that there is a being that creates universes is that what i understood yeah okay what is this evidence for the being that you say is responsible for universes oh, okay good that's another one of the things we talked about as well um mm -hmm. the emergence and explosion of the early christian church under such hostile conditions yeah, that's not really convincing. There are things that happen strangely all through history that are expected, unexpected, whatever, big surprising things that you wouldn't really think could occur that do um, historic events that are not super, you know, some sort of weird supernatural thing. I really don't know how that would be evidence of something that creates universes. Okay, well, given the Christian claim, the whole thing behind it, right? This is appealing to my, my personal life experience a little bit, but just the natural aspects that go along with my personal life experience that, that come with the territory of the life I live. Like I, I told you this as well in the last call, uh, where I became a Christian, where I, where I gave my life to Christ was when I was going in and out of custody because my late teens to early 20s was spent largely in jail, always in and out of jail. Okay. And so... When hearing the Christian claim, because, you know, like I investigated that possibility because I'd heard and saw many different people who overcame criminality by giving their life to Christ. So obviously I would look at that avenue as a possibility to help me escape from a criminal life. And when listening to the Christian claim and looking at the history, I had to ask myself and say, OK, if I was alive during that time, and I stood before a judge, and the judge told me all I had to do was stop stealing cars and you know, redeem me, return me to my normal life. And if I don't, he's going to feed me to the lions. Well, I'd stop stealing cars in a second. So it doesn't jive or make sense to me that these people would say, go ahead, see us to the lions. We'll never renounce. Okay, so you don't believe in martyr? You think that martyrdom in a religion means the religion's claims are all true? Oh, but see, with martyrism and any other part and any other claim in history, martyrism usually sparks a military uprising. But for the first three and a half centuries, there are tons of Buddhist coming. martyrs who don't take up arms that are pacifist. Some some of them even self immolate, but they but they're not. I mean, I, you haven't. I don't know how, that there's been like very much aggression in Buddhism for centuries. I mean, but they, there's definitely Buddhist martyrs. Yeah, okay. okay. But but that. I'm just saying that martyrdom is not proof of, a, of that there is a being in existence that create has that has the power to and is creating universes. I'm asking where you see that. I'm not really asking about the claims in Christianity. Whether or not Christianity is true would be irrelevant to the fact that there would be a being that we can demonstrate exists that creates universes. Like where is that being, right? Like if I the cause, you're claiming that the, that the cause of the universe is, I'm assuming, you know, what you would call God. And what I'm saying is that for something to cause other things, and I think we did discuss this, that um, 
things that do not exist cannot be the cause of other things. So the, if, a, if, if there was a being that produced universes, it either does exist or did exist at one point. And so then the question would be where or how do we access that being or the evidence of that being's past existence? I'm not really asking about the Christian claims because whether it's a Christian God or a Muslim God or just some other being or whatever is, is kind of irrelevant to the question of where is the evidence that there, for this being? Where is it? Where would it reside? Where would we look for it? What would we expect to find? Okay. Um, okay, so this, this is what I'm saying. Okay, so what I'm saying is I see the Christian claim, the how the Christian church, how Christianity came to be, the extraordinary hostile conditions that it came up in, I see that as evidence of divine intervention, that that happened by... Okay, but what I'm saying is you keep saying there's this result that I'm claiming a God is responsible for. And what I'm saying is a God, if, unless the God exists, it's not responsible for anything. I can say that my toaster keeps burning my toast because of gremlins. But unless I can demonstrate somehow gremlins, I'm just making a claim that you know this outcome is caused by this thing that I can't even demonstrate. What I'm asking you is, can you demonstrate that this God is there to be causing these weird things that you think are impossible without a God in the Christian church, to be causing a universe that you think can't be caused without this God? You keep saying, here's the results that I think the God, and, I'm, and this God is causing this, and this God is causing that. And I'm like, if there's no God, then it's not causing any of this. So we need to separate I'm trying to get you to separate the things that you're claiming God does. And so how do we get a look at God to determine that God does do these things that you're saying it does? Oh, okay. Well, see there. Yeah. God, there's no test. There's no scientific experiment or test man can do to find God. God can only be shown if God so chooses to show himself. So you're saying we, there is no way to examine your claims that there's a God behind these things that you think, that you're just simply saying a God has to be causing it. And, and, and why? Okay, now I'm gonna, why? Go, to, why now I'm gonna go to this next part. The, the last <laughs> but wait a minute, wait a minute, hold before on. you move on, okay, just, no. just look at the problem that I'm dealing with here. I'm trying to understand, but, but what I'm dealing with is, my toaster is burning the toast, gremlins keep messing with the toaster to make it burn the toast. Why would Tracy right. say that? And I say, because what else would be burning the toast? And, and you start to tell me, and I say, no, I reject that. Only gremlins could be causing this. So you say, well, Tracy, do you see gremlins anywhere? And I say, well, they, only, they can only be seen when they choose to manifest. So <laughs> I have got a problem here because I'm asserting that these little beings are doing something, but I'm not really demonstrating the little beings. And if they don't exist, then something else is burning the toast. Whether I believe the gremlins are doing it or not is irrelevant. If I can't okay, demonstrate I gremlins, okay. they're not burning the toast. Right. Okay, I agree. Or they may not, there. I don't I know. Right, I agree with you there that it could be something as simple as you have a malfunctioning to toaster mm -hmm. that's not working properly and you just have to get the circuits fixed. Mm -hmm. Or your analogy, it could actually be invisible gremlins that are messing with the circuitry. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it is, I'm saying it could be. Right, but I'm saying convince me that it's not. Convince you that it's not. Not the gremlins. Me. Well, I don't know if it is or not. Like, Okay, but, most, but do you believe me? Do you crazy? think that it's What's reasonable for me to assert that it is? If I can't demonstrate them, and if I tell you that there's no way to examine them and there's no way to prove that these things are, but I'm going to continue to say that something that I can't even confirm exists okay. is causing things. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, Chasey. If, you, if you're having the problem with one toaster and you go get that toaster fixed or even replace it and you go get a brand new toaster and then you keep having that problem again and again and again, and every time you put a toaster in a certain geographical location in your house, it does this. But if you plug it into any other receptacle, it doesn't. Well, then I would say you have evidence that there must be something supernatural going on. Why? Or it could be that receptacle. So then if you get the receptacle, you get an electrician to look at the receptacle and fix the receptacle and look at and cross every, go through every possibility that the receptacle's fine. And every time you plug this toaster into the receptacle, just with you and nobody else, it's doing something. Well, then I would say you've got evidence that there's something else going on and it can't be explained in a naturalistic frame. Does it mean gremlins? 
something supernatural. It doesn't necessarily Why would you think it's something supernatural? When you can't find a cause, why would you jump to supernatural? Is there evidence that the claim is supernatural? No, you've only said we haven't found a natural cause. You have not demonstrated a supernatural cause. But what? The, okay, okay. How can you demonstrate if there's a if there's a supernatural cause if you think that everything that ha everything that happens must have a natural cause? By demonstrating the supernatural. But how can you demonstrate the supernatural? If that's up to you, because that's what you have to do. That's okay, what you're, you're basically you're saying. You're basically saying I don't have to demonstrate my cause because it's. I'm just going to label it supernatural. So I'm, I'm not. There is no burden on me to demonstrate the cause. All I have to do is say I don't accept the natural explanations, and that makes it supernatural. And that's incorrect. You have not demonstrated no, 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 there no. is supernatural at all. No, 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 no. I'm I'm saying that if I have gone through every possible way that it could have a naturalistic claim. How do you know you've gone claim. through every possible way that it could be naturally explained? How do you know this? How do you know that there's okay. not a natural every explanation you haven't overlooked? That, every possible way that can be explained in this way. So then if I've gone through every possible way that I can imagine and anybody else is and it's still doing the same thing. And you still so have then, to demonstrate your supernatural exists or you cannot just simply say you would just at that point, the only honest thing would be to say, I don't know what's causing this. OK, but what if that is evidence of the supernatural? It's not. It's evidence that you don't know what's causing it. Do you know that that's not evidence that's crossed? That it, that of yes, because of evidence of the supernatural would demonstrate the supernatural actually exists. If you can't demonstrate the supernatural exists and you say, I've tried every natural explanation I can think of, you are left with, I do not know what is causing this because we have no, no demonstration that there really is a supernatural. And all of the natural explanations we have exhausted and we still do not have an answer. The answer does not just default to supernatural. That's ridiculous. Yeah, okay, but it does warrant investigation. Yes, I would, I would love to investigate, and I would love to find evidence if there is supernatural so that we could start examining how the supernatural functions and how it causes things. That would be a really stunning thing to discover. Oh, okay, all right, all right. So there, that's what I'm saying, right? So I'm saying, fine, you don't get to just jump to the supernatural, but you can say, let's investigate and look at and see if this has got a supernatural cause. I think anybody this would, would want to investigate something that they don't understand or don't know. If I don't know what's causing something, investigating is ex absolutely the proper step. Okay. All right, so that is the, the process. Like, don't just think I jump on Christianity one day, like seven years from 92 to 99, where I looked at it from all different perspectives and sides. And then finally I said, okay, I'll give it a try. But it didn't just end there. Like, I'm giving you my personalized experience of it, but I'm just trying to let you know that I did go through this whole process. And so I, I put it to the test, I tried it, I looked at it from various That's different excellent. perspectives. And Yeah, so... Um, it, First off, where does your personal experience inform you about something that happened at the beginning of the universe? I mean, I mean, it, you say it doesn't just re relate back to Christianity, but if I told you that I invented a time machine and I created the mm -hmm. universe, would you believe me? Um, Mark, well, unless Mark you I went back in time. time. Machine, probably not. Okay, then do I have the same? I, can you? Am I on the same level as your God? Can would you say that is equally likely that Eric created the universe and my God created the universe? Well, like I said, if you could show me a time machine, then fine, I would say all right, I believe that. Okay, so can you have the same standard of evidence for your God? Um. Well, I sort of do. You do. Okay. Yeah. Then, but this is appeal to I, personal life experience. Like I said, like it's not. Yeah, and I and 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 I, I I think that the underpinnings of that isn't completely honest. That's why I'm picking at it because I want to see if that's true. Um, I also think that um, when it comes to talking about things that you don't understand, right? Tracy had it absolutely right. It's saying I don't know. Like that's that that's where you stop. 
You know, you stop trying to come up with answers when you don't have answers, and you say, I don't know, and you continue to investigate. And if you don't know, and you don't know by the time you die, you leave it for the next generation to pick up. You don't just get to say, you know, my God or Eric went back in time and created the universe. So when you called in, you were saying that you're not convinced that God didn't create the universe. That doesn't really seem like a, a, a great way to start. I mean, how about I don't know how the universe was created or if it was created? I mean, really, wouldn't that be the more honest thing to say? Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Um, because otherwise I'm going to open my own church. <laughs> Interesting. I see. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> Mark, I want to say, first of all, I appreciated your last call and I appreciate this call. We do have some other callers. Um, but I, I thank you for your input and it's always interesting. So, um, if it's okay, we'll go ahead and, and, and kind of hold on that. You can think about that, maybe call back another time, you know, after you've had time to process it and, and come up with, you know, your, your ideas on it. You don't have to respond at this moment. Um, and we'll go ahead and move on to some other calls if that's all right. Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, thank you. Appreciate your call. Bye, Mark. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> okay. And I just want to say, I put a little thing in chat. I don't know if the studio like the, saw it, but we were doing this thing where we were putting people on hold, and I kind of put that on hold instead of hanging up, and I wasn't sure if we were still doing that. It was like a while back when they told me to, to do that. So if I'm not supposed oh. to be doing that, you know, I can go ahead and let them go, but I'm, I'm going to just put them on hold so you can deal with it or let me know not to. Uh, all right. So that was good. And then... We'll go ahead then. We have another one that's similar to that one, so I don't want to take two back-to-back -back ones like that, but we do have another theist caller that's a little bit different, so we'll try, let's see if I got this right. Paul in Knoxville? Are you there? Yes. Hey, Paul, yes. you're on with Tracy and Eric. Hello. 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 How are you guys? Good, how are you? Excellent. I'm wonderful, I'm wonderful. So, are there people in front of you right now? There's an audience, yes. Mm -hmm. Are they all atheists? I don't know. I haven't met them all. Oh, okay. So you're telling me you don't want to believe in a God? No, it's not about want. Um, I'm right now don't believe in a God, but I understand that you do, and that's fine. So what's on your mind today? Well, I hope I'll be able to show you that God is real. Okay. When I was, today, right now, I am 17. Okay. I gave my life to Christ, just like the other one said. He gave, but the other one was older than me. I'm 17, and I gave my life to Jesus when I was 16. I mean, I'm almost turning 18. I'm almost 18. So okay. two years ago, about two years ago, I gave my life to Jesus. When I was 12 years old, because before I explain it, I was in a bookstore once, and I saw a book. It said, I forgot the guy's name, but it was about a pastor that went from Christianity to atheism. Okay. And I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm about to tell you about the same thing happened to me. When I was 12 years old, my church was having a revival. At 12 years old, you know, I didn't do anything bad. I wasn't a bad kid. I was only 12. And our church was having a revival where people give their lives to Christ. And, you know, Jesus says in the Bible, he said, whoever asks for the Holy Spirit, I will give it to them. And that's okay. what I wanted. Okay. My friends were doing it. So I went ahead and did. I asked. I asked Jesus. I said, please fill me with the Holy Spirit. I gave my life to you. But after that, nothing happened. Nothing happened. From 12 to 16, I became messed up. I did messed up things. And today I'm so ashamed of them. And I can't believe I did them. And I could not stop doing them. And I mean, I'm so ashamed. I wish I could tell you guys so you, you could know, but I'm so ashamed. I'm sorry that you're coping with shame because it's a very toxic emotion. But um, what I want to say is from all the way to 16, I saw on YouTube. You can look on you. When you guys get home, please, you can look it all up. Homosexual found Jesus. Muslim finds Jesus. You can look it all up, and you will see that all of them say, all of them that find Jesus, Jesus makes them a new creation, and they say it's not a, it's not a religion. 
but a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's 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 the crazy thing. After I gave my life to Jesus at 16, I said, God, I'm so tired of the way I'm living. I didn't even know if God was really real. I questioned a lot. Okay, so wait, I, before, before what, can, let me interrupt you for just a moment. Let me just kind of fast forward this. Is the idea here that you were living a life that seemed out of control, and then you, you know, signed on with Jesus, and then everything got better for you? I mean, is that where this is going? Is that the sum? Because <laughs> we hear this story a lot, yeah. and that's fine. I mean, it's, it's fine. It's okay to say that, that, you know, this is my story, and, and that's good. But I just want to, we have a limited time span here. So if we can just summarize, is that a fair assessment of where this was headed? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you now attribute your life change to divine intervention. Is that fair? Yeah, I guess. Okay. I mean, I'm not trying to trick you or anything. And if, if I ask you a question like this and you say, yes, that's correct, and then later I go somewhere with it and you need to stop me and explain where I went off the rails, that's totally fine. It's not like you agreed to this before and you can't, you know, alter that or clarify it. You can absolutely correct me, I, but I'm just trying to move this call along a little bit. So, yes, there are people who join churches, join religions who have issues with their lives and then their lives get more in control. And in fact, people that are raised religious, this happens pretty frequently because what occurs is you're, they, I'm not gonna say you because I, I don't wanna speak for you, but there are many people who are raised in a religion that doesn't really prepare them for handling life uh, in, in a world without that religion. So what they do is they're pretty much raised with the ideals within the religion and then if they leave the religion and try to go out on their own, they have no framework and no support system and no uh, critical thinking skills or anything to sort of help them get by in life because the only framework they've learned, so for example, when it comes to sexuality, the only thing they've learned is don't have sex. So they haven't really gotten like the full robust concepts around, for example, responsible sexuality and you know careful sexuality, respectful sexuality, consent issues, things like that. So they get into the real world and they just don't do a lot of very wise things because they haven't been raised to really think these things through. They've just been told, do this, don't do that. And when they find out that in the real world it doesn't really work that way, it's almost like this is all falling apart and crumbling and things were so much more in control when it was black and white and simple and you just don't have sex till you get married and it makes everything so easy. And you go back to that, you accept, you accept it, you buy into it and suddenly it's better than it was when you were out there on your own with no framework to work with at all. And you see, go ahead. You see, but this is the crazy thing. When I gave my life to Jesus, it's been two years now in this two years. It's so crazy. Wonderful. Like every single day I come to Jesus, anything I ask him, like, Nothing in this world, everything I do every single day, you know, we have hobbies, we have fun, it makes us happy, but nothing comes close to how perfect the peace and joy he fills me with. Yeah, I had the same experience. I had the same experience when I was a Christian, right? I had the same thing where I felt so relieved. First of all, I was super relieved that I didn't have to worry about hell anymore. Oh, man, what a relief that was, that I didn't have to worry about what was the evil things might happen to me in the afterlife or I might never see my family again. I didn't have to worry about negotiating my romantic relationships because you didn't have sex until you got married. I didn't have to worry about, you know, the, the morality or the questions concerning drug use, concerning drinking, concerning all these other things because I had it all laid out to me in these rules, right, that said, just don't do these things. It, so I didn't have to think about them at all. It was very, very, I mean, there's, there's plenty of studies that show that people actually sometimes do have a lot more relief, feelings of relief, feelings of calm when they're religious, because you don't really worry about things because you don't have to think about them. It's so much easier when you think that a God is taking care of everything for you and you simply follow a set of prescribed rules and you don't have to really negotiate the world. You see, that's every, yeah, in my relationship with Jesus, look, then tell me, in my relationship with Jesus, I'm just falling more and more in love with Jesus. Like, there's no one closer to, to me than Jesus. Like, he is my best friend. He is my true love. He is yeah. my father. He is my dad. I know that's and how you feel. He, I, <laughs> wow. I know, but look, 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 look. Before, before I had Jesus, I was so afraid of hell. 
I was so I was too. It was so nice mm -hmm. to not have to have that fear anymore. So the church makes no. you afraid of hell. Then they, they yeah. get you to, they coerce you to adopt God. And then you don't fear hell anymore and you feel so much better. And thank you, God, for making me yeah. so happy and calm and relieved and making my life feel so, so much better. Do you fear death? No. Mm -mm. No? I'm not looking right forward now. to dying. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's like I'm not looking forward to dying, but I don't fear like well, don't the idea of being dead. Well, that's what gives me. I, that's what gives me joy. That's where my joy comes from. When I think of heaven, because that's that's where my home is. This is just. This yeah, life this is, is this joy. life is just where you wipe your dirty shoes before you enter your death. I know. I understand, and it's really sad because if there is no afterlife, that means you've pretty much blown this life. You've pretty much treated this life as something that doesn't matter, and then you died, and there was nothing else. If you, you know, it, it's, I'm not going to go to the, if you're wrong, because that's not really a good argument, but I do want to at least point out that, you know, yeah, if you're wrong and you're sitting here telling me this life is not what matters, it's the next life. I'm basically saying that if there is no next life, you've just blown this one by thinking it doesn't even matter. It does matter. It matters the most. It matters Which in that you're getting into the next one, but devoting this life to an afterlife that so, may not exist means you may have lost your life. So you also don't believe in Satan. You don't think the devil's real. I, yeah, no, no I, I think these are stories. For These are stories on the level well, of a story you would tell a child, really. I mean, it's sad to me. I was watching Jack Hanna the other day, and he was on some interview about hunting, trophy hunting, whatever. And my jaw dropped because he's sitting there saying, God, the good Lord made predators and prey animals and made this balance, and people messed up the pet. And I was like, what is this man's degree in? I go and look it up, and he's basically a zookeeper. He has no real degrees in biology or, you know, requisite degrees well, would let him understand how animals came to exist in the forms that they do. And I was thinking to myself, how can this guy believe this? And it's fine because I understand the idea of believing it in the sense that I believed it. And I believed it around the same age as you're believing it. And I'm not going to patronize you. I'm not going to say, you'll outgrow this because I outgrew it. Because there's people that don't. There's people that stay in it their whole lives, right? So I'm not going to sit there and tell you this is just this phase for you because that's very patronizing to tell any young person that. Uh, so what I am going to say, though, is there are people who change their lives who don't go through God. And the idea that you okay. changed your life is not necessarily evidence of a God. I do understand why it had an impact on you, but there's a lot of reasons that people can mess up their lives, especially when they're not prepared for, for life in the real world. And religion does not really, in, in a lot of cases, especially with conservative religion, does not prepare you for handling life. And then when you go out and fail, okay. it, you know the Amish? You know how you have Amish people who live in these like very cloistered communities? Yeah. Well, they have a certain period where the children get to an age around your age where they're allowed to go out into the real world and sort of explore. And then they make a quote decision about whether or not they want to come back. But when you've been living in this Amish community, I mean, can you imagine what it's like outside that community when you really immerse yourself. I mean, they have interaction with the world, but the idea of actually leaving that community and going and living outside in the world outside that community where you had horses and buggies, literally, uh, and now you're dealing with the internet and cell phones and nightclubs and, and these kids get out there and a lot of them go back because what, what else are they gonna do? They're not prepared, they're not equipped to handle life outside that community. <clears throat> so you okay. have a situation where religion doesn't prepare people, they go out and fail, they come back, and, and it's so much safer to come back to the religion. And I understand it, but you see, think about it. Um, you see, when I told you when I was 12, nothing happened. Do you wanna know why nothing happened? Okay. Why so, many, is... why so many Why so many? pastors come, go from a Christian to an atheist? Because in the Bible, it talks about, in Revelations 3.16, it talks about lukewarms, people that are lukewarm, a person that is neither cold nor hot. Sure, yeah, I'm familiar with because the verse. After, yeah, yeah, after Jesus saved me, that's what I didn't understand. I wonder, why didn't my other Christian friends, why didn't, no, why didn't nobody tell me that it's this amazing? Like, after Jesus saved me, you're just falling in love. It's true love. It's real. It's no more of this world's love. What is this world's love? 
two people love one another so much. Right, but married, I mean, they're beautiful. You, you're they you're walking. Alive. You're basing all of this on personal internal feelings, and that's what's convincing you. I mean, that's what you keep coming back to: the idea that you have this okay. amazing feeling. Wait, wait, let me say one more thing. If you guys remember, please go home and look up on um, YouTube, like all these different religions, because that's one of the other reasons I didn't believe. There's so many religions. How could this one be the one? What that makes no sense. Why would you risk that? How that old were no you? Sense. Well, in believe. fact, what would you say to somebody who was, for example, a Muslim who says this has just really been the most life-altering thing? Especially, especially, especially Muslims. There's a Muslim on the voice on the radio, voice of Martyrs Radio. He beheaded 200 Christians, and every time they do this, they take drugs because they're not able to do it without right. drugs. <laughs> well, that, I, can, that I can understand that. What I'm saying, though, is what about a Muslim who's not beheading people, oh. who says, my oh, religion this, is this really Muslim, good? You, if, you, what I, I guess what I'm asking you is, what if I said that my life as an atheist is so amazing? It's so much better than anything I ever experienced as a Christian, and that's why I believe atheism is correct. Okay, wait, wait. What I'm trying to tell you, yeah, you're t telling me your life is amazing. I believe you, but I could stay, I could, I could sit here. I'm sitting on the ground right now. Mm -hmm. I could sit here all day and tell you how amazing Jesus is, but you will never understand unless you do it yourself, unless you, I, I challenge you. And you will never you understand remember. what it means to own your own life until you finally do it. You know, it, you can, you can serve whatever masters you want to serve, but in the end, you're just giving up your life to something that you think is worth giving up your life to, but that really there's no evidence that it's even true, except that you feel really happy about it. Okay, then, if you guys remember when you get home, don't let anybody know. I'm not- I'm Why would I care if anybody well, knew what I looked at on YouTube? And, and we're on a live no, no, show. No, I'm not, I'm not, no, I'm not talking about YouTube. When you get home, don't let anyone in the house know what you're doing. Just go alone. Doesn't matter where in your room. Just say, oh, just with your heart, not with somebody. If you do it with somebody, you're not going to be doing it with your whole heart. Okay. Like even I even watch. You realize there are Christians point. who do not believe that the Holy Spirit inhabits people today. There are Christians who reject the doctrine. There's a there are Christians who would tell you that the Bible says that this is incorrect. What you're telling me. Yeah. That's yeah. why it talks about lukewarm. Yeah. Why, yeah. <laughs> right, but I'm saying there's other Christians who believe the Bible who would say that what you're telling exactly. me is yeah. blasphemy. Do you understand that? It's all about that? depending on Jesus. Without depending on Jesus... Why you do you believe, other than your feelings, why do you believe that, that, this, that Jesus is doing anything? That Jesus is doing anything? Yeah. Outside of of your feel, you have a good feeling, and so this to you has no. convinced. No, isn't that what you've been saying? No, you Jesus could sit there all not. day and tell me how good no, you feel. Yeah, no. No. What well, um, Jesus is everything. That's He's what you. That that's what you're saying. But what? Where? Outside of your feeling, what? What do you have that demonstrates this? Wait. Why? Outside of how you, can't, you feel, I can't, I can't. Look, okay. how do you know this feeling I, 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 is attributable to a God? Feeling? Hello? Yeah, yeah, I'm asking how you know the feeling comes from a God. A feeling of peace? Yeah. You think or, people can't feel p at peace without a God? Of course. If... The, no. Without God, I can't be in peace every single day I live. I'm sorry without, that you believe without, that. Yeah. I'm so sorry that you believe that. I mean, it's sad to me that you believe that the only way you can have peace is to buy into religious claims. Like, that really breaks no, my you heart. Can have, you can, yeah, you can have peace, but it will never be completely perfect. And the guy I was talking about, the Muslim, that did all beheaded 200 Christians. Even if you had, <laughs> even if you had what would be, wait, even if you had what would be considered a perfect peace that is not demonstrated, that's not evidence of a God. It's evidence that you experience what you know, describe as perfect that's peace. That's why I, I know. That's why it says in the Bible, blessed is he who, who does not. Why should God. I care what's in the Bible? I've read it. Why should I care what's in it? Oh, you don't. No, it's okay. you don't have to care. It's okay. Okay, but then, the then let's not guy, quote the Bible. Let's talk about reality. 
in reality, you have these feelings. You think they come from God. Why do you think they're coming from a God? Uh, they're, they're feelings, I agree, and they come. I think they come from you. You're okay, saying they the don't. Next, um, what's, what's, I forgot. It's Eric? Eric. Yeah. Yes. Now, now I forgot um, your name. Tracy. Mm -hmm. Tracy. Tracy and Eric. Are you two friends? We know each other. I mean, we're we're acquaintances yeah. and we that, get along. <laughs> yeah, that's what that's what that's what it is. That's all it is. It talks in the Bible. There are many verses that use the word simplicity. Why should we care about what's in the Bible, Paul? I'm asking you, okay, okay. what evidence okay, you have okay. that your but feelings that, are coming from God? I care about you. That's why I'm I don't care if you care about me. Because I'm asking you to tell me what what evidence do you have that your feelings you come from God? You're going to have to answer that question before we can move because on. Because I'm in a because just like you have a friend, just like you have a mother and father and you're in a relationship with them. That's what it is, a relationship. No, with it's not God. because other people acknowledge that my parents existed and other people actually and, acknowledge Eric and they can see him on a monitor and I can touch Eric and he's right there and we can do a blood draw on Eric and test if he's human. We can do all kinds of exams on Eric and I cannot do that with okay. this friend that you claim you have. But I have to tell you guys this one thing. This is going to be the last thing because Please. we can't get answers from you. I know, I know. Okay, thank you, thank you, last thing. Please, just with all your heart, doesn't matter where, just I'm challenging you guys. Alone, where nobody knows, doesn't matter if someone else, but you have to be alone. Yeah, that's yeah, not going to happen. We've talked, we've that's, dropped that call. That's, uh, We're moving on to, let's see, we have another one that's been waiting here. Let's go for, well, you know what? Hmm. We have, we have an atheist that's been waiting. That sounds like an interesting call. So we'll take that one. Let me try that one. And then we'll get back to theists in a minute. But right now we're going to take, uh, is this Dave in Dallas? Hi, Tracy. How are you doing? Good. Thank you so much for waiting. Okay, oh, so yeah. you're you're on and, with and Tracy Eric. and Eric, and and you have an interesting question. Hey, Dave. <laughs> so yeah, I do. You're so, feeling so, like a minority in the atheist community. You got it. You okay. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So uh, you know, I'm a human, as most humans do. You want to find friends, people with the same kind of things, you know, same kind of uh, things in common. Right. I understand. And, and, and right. So, and then obviously, uh, as an atheist, I try to reach out to, to, to uh, the communities here in Dallas and, and try to meet more people. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I found that because I grew up and just, I'm, I find myself, I'm a conservative person. Right. I'm a typically, and I just don't hardly ever find any atheists that are conservative or can, or, or, you know, you, you, I seem like, I feel like kind of like a pariah. Okay. And, uh, I, I, I find that most atheists are left leaning. Okay. Um, I know you don't like to talk about politics on the show. I really don't want to talk about politics so much as. No, but you're, you're bringing in, you're, you're bringing atheist. in a legitimate atheist issue. So what you're mm -hmm. saying is I am a conservative right. atheist, most atheists lean liberal. And so when I go into these groups, a lot of times I'm feeling like the minority again, which is what I thought I could right. you know, put set aside when and, I and, and, met, met more atheists. <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, it's just like if you tell a group of, of theists, hey, I'm an atheist, and they kind of, you know, yeah. look at you strangely or treat you differently. The same thing happens to me in, in when I start to discuss things with people. And it's 2018, right? We're not going to kid ourselves that politics aren't in the forefront of a lot of discussions. Right. No, you're you know, right. You hear something. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, 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 and you hear something and it's kind of like, well, you know, I really don't agree with that. And if you, you start to question, well, just like you guys did with the last two callers. Well, why do you believe that? Why do you think that? Right. What's your evidence? Well, blah, blah, blah. And they start to, um, you know, look at you strangely. Mm -hmm. And and it's hard to make any relationships. I don't want to be with theists and talk about God all the time. Right. And I'd rather talk to atheists. And but no, you know, I understand what you're saying. And and so you right. you it's kind of like a. I mean, it's it's like you're in a between a rock and a hard place, right? So if you get into a theist group. 
um, you feel like I can't really freely express myself because these people are going to like pile on and disagree with me, then you go to an atheist group and you know that there's certain issues and if you start to express your views, they're going to pile on and you're going to be unpopular. And so you're kind of like, where do I, where do I socialize? Where do where I get I my... Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I understand that. I, I want to just say, um, in the vein of reaching out for common ground with you, um, I have, for example, often recommended, for, I've had like young women contact me who are not out as atheists, who say my family's very conservative and I'm in this conservative religion, and they feel very oppressed. I mean, you can imagine what it's like growing up for a young female in a conservative Christian home where you do not accept that right. you are an inferior being and yet everything that you're surrounded by is telling you to submit and you, are, you, know, you just don't live up to standards because you you know, you're not male. And so... These young women will say to me, hey, where can I find camaraderie? And every now and then I send them to, I'll look up atheist groups in their area and I'll say, well, here's like a humanist group or a secular group or somewhere where you can go. And a few times they've come back to me and said, hey, I went to that group and I got my ass grabbed. And so what they're doing is kind of like what you're describing. In their heads, they're thinking, finally, I'm going to go and be around a group of people who is not, who aren't going to treat me like, you know, the woman, and then they get into the group and then they're sexualized, even in the group that they thought wasn't going to do this to them, right? So they get out of this group that that does nothing but sexualize them, where they're like, please let me meet people who respect me and treat me like a human being. They go to the atheist group and then they're right. treated like that, and they, you know, to be some of them will go back and try again, and some of them won't, but they are having a similar experience to you where they're thinking to themselves, finally, like-minded well, people. <laughs> well, I mean, but you understand what I'm saying. They're thinking that that attitude I, is I a religious thing. And then when they get out of the religion and they go to the atheist group, they encounter the same, you know, sexist treatment. I'm not saying yeah, that this is like, every group. different, and then they're like, well, that sucks. <laughs> yeah, that's really similar, only even more aggressive. And so what you're describing, there's other atheists that have other reasons for feeling similarly, where they say, I thought I was moving into a group that would be more accepting of me, and they're not really. Um, and right. you're having that experience as well. I don't, I, I, unfortunately, I'm, I'm kind of at a loss as how to fix it. Because, yeah, do you have a thought on I do, that? I oh, do. Eric has an idea for Woo! you, so you've called it the right time. Yeah, oh. Eric. Well, <laughs> <laughs> hey, Dave, you know there was a, uh, a, a, an atheist booth at last year's RNC, right? I did know that, yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, when it comes to politics, um, I, I, I don't want to go too deep into the, the, the substance of the politics, but what I do want to go into is, is talk to you about just how tied up uh, the RNC has gotten with um, Christian values and, and, and promoting Christianity in particular, right? Um, you know, one thing that we do have in common... I, 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 I yeah, I don't know, uh, kind of. Well, I mean... But I don't, you, see, I don't think that'll ever happen or go anywhere. That's my thought. I mean, you still have the First Amendment. You still have... There, yeah. Uh, mm, well, ab absolutely. You know, and, 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 and nobody... And I wouldn't vote for... I, I like Marco Rubio to start well, with, and I'm it, like, well, then he said, you know, God's law is above man's. I said, you're out. Screw yeah, you. It's, it's, it's not even, it, we don't even need to go into individual people. What we have in common well, yeah. is, uh, you know, the mission statement of the ACA is promoting the separation of religion and government, right? I think that striving right. toward that ideal will help make that a better system for you. It's not just trying to make the world a better system for, you know, uh, uh, the, the left-leaning atheists. You know, it's trying to make it a, a, an even playing ground for everybody, right? Yeah. And, right. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that you're there, man. Um, everybody should feel like they belong. Um, and even though we don't agree yeah, politically, you belong here. I accept you. We yeah. accept you. And you know what? It's going to be okay because we're fighting to make it better that way. We're fighting for that even, even playing ground. And then we can disagree all we want. And I guess that's a kind of a good idea. I mean, if we it, can, it, it, I was just going to say, if we can continue sort of fighting to broaden the atheist community, there would be a broader range of views within the community, correct? I mean, that almost seems like it would, well, it seems reasonable. I don't know if it would actually happen, but um, it, it seems like the more people we can, you know, extend outreach to or, uh, 
you know, gain as far as enlarging the community, um, that would be helpful in expanding diversity in some of the groups. Yeah, I agree. That'd be great. So we're trying. Can, can I, can I sh well, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a yeah, but kind of guy. Uh, and <laughs> I, do you have time for me to share a particular story with you? How much time would it take? Uh, one minute. Okay, do it. All right, here we go. The, and I'm, I'm not going to say any names or anything. There's a particular candidate running against another candidate here in DFW area. And that person is the, the Democratic candidate happens to be a, uh, he, he happens to be the husband of a preacher. Okay. And he, he is also, he's gay. Mm -hmm. So, and one of the things on, you know, and some people in one of the local groups were talking about that. And one of the things on his uh, website said, I've, you know, used my Christian values to formulate how I approach the world, you know, and the particular topic was immigration. And so I'm in discussing this with people. I'm like, well, that's something like Ted Cruz would say. How could you support? And they, they were asking, hey, let's all get together and support this candidate. And I thought, well, you know, how can you support that candidate if they're saying that? But everybody else was like, hey, we got to support this guy. And I, I don't I don't get that. I, I, I think they kind of like look at we just don't, you know, we're if they, if you're if they're against are they against conservatives or are they against theism you know yeah i think that I, would I be a disturbing comment I, I mean if, if a candidate had on their website i you know my decisions in office will be you know formulated via my christian worldview i would be concerned no matter what ticket they were running on i agree and that's and a that's a concern and <laughs> i i raised that point and i got kicked out Oh, the discussion groups. Yeah, I mean, it, it, of course, it went a little further from there, but you know, it's just, it's just, I don't know. It seemed a cognitive dissonance to me. You know. Yeah. Now, you believe now, I good. I will say that I am the you know, what is it, the greater of two goods, I guess, I, is something I think I heard, it might have been Jeff D that said that, like when people say the, the better, like the worse of two evils, and he says, well, isn't that the same as the greater of two goods? Um, and so I do believe in going for the least horrible candidate, <laughs> but... Oh, I do too. But putting, you know, re religion shapes my political, you know, decisions. Uh, it would 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 rank as one of the check boxes for potentially horrible, right? Like so, as I'm going down the check boxes, um, if the uh, if both candidates said that, then it would be a wash, you know. So yeah. so I if in the end I would have to weigh the candidates. I'm not going to say that I wouldn't vote like for a liberal Christian candidate that maybe has this perspective on it if there were a, another candidate, for example, that was like, I'm racist and sexist and, you know, my goal is to strip everybody's rights, I would probably be like, the liberal Christian is needs to be corrected, but at least they've got the perspective of, you know, not wanting to grab everybody's rights away. So I'm not going to say that I would never vote for a candidate like that, but it would certainly be a red flag for me and one of the things that I would have yeah. to weigh in against other things, for sure. All right. Yeah. I mean, I won't vote for certain <laughs> conservative candidates. If I hear those words out of their mouth, their mouth, God's laws or above man's laws, I'm like, I'm not voting for you. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough <laughs> one to get over, I agree. You know, yeah. Yeah. it's not going to happen. No, I, but, uh, I, I hear your concern. On the other side, yeah. yeah anyway. So, hey, thank you very much. I just thank you. Wish everybody would calm down a little bit about the whole politics thing. Well, um, if nothing else, it's you, gonna be okay. you were we're able to okay. share with people that maybe they should extend a little compassion and patience with somebody with a different view. It's just a discussion, for God's sake. Well, excuse me, I shouldn't say that on the internet. <laughs> That's <laughs> it. You're done. <laughs> no. Okay. Hey, no, yeah, thank you. Say, hey, long-term fan of the show. Really enjoy listening to you guys. Eric, okay. it's great to see you on there. I like to talk even. Ah, thank oh, you, man. You're good. Okay, thank hey, you. Y'all right. take care. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah. Bye now. Before we move to the next person, what I wanted to say is, yeah, yeah. is um, if Dave doesn't see um, a group that he you know, can find, most likely there are a ton of people who are looking for the same thing. So, Dave, start a group, man. Um, we, yeah. Yeah, we, we were actually at uh, uh, Star of India uh, a few months ago, and we had a parent 
asking if uh, there's anywhere that they can go for a secular families group, somewhere where right. it's not just atheists in the pub, <laughs> right. but it's a place where they could go and let their kids play and that kind of stuff. Because a lot of people with young kids, they go to their play dates and it's, oh, what church do you go to? First question, right? You should go to my church. That's not a bad idea. That's actually a really good idea. If Dave is still listening, I think that's that's something to you know yeah. maybe put your little headline that's like conservative question mark atheist question mark looking for you know yeah. people and, to hang out with. And yeah. we're actually getting that going. Okay. Uh, here, I just want to send that quick plug. Uh, oh, the good. ACA is also starting up. Like a family group? Yes, awesome. secular families. Um, so if anybody wants to check it out, um, definitely look on Facebook, on Meetup. I think uh, That's a good the plug. first meeting is going to be at the end of this month. And um, we're hoping that it goes well. We've got some really amazing well, I hope people it goes well putting too. it together. So. No, that's an awesome plug. I'm glad yeah. you mentioned it. All right. Hi, Robin. Let's see what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Let's see. Okay, we've got a theist that's been holding. We'll try okay. this one. This is Chris and Vallejo, or is it Vallejo or Vallejo? How do you pronounce that? California? It's uh, Vallejo. Vallejo. Okay, so hey, Chris, Vallejo. you're on with Tracy and Eric. How are you? Yeah, hi, hi, Tracy. Doing hi. doing well, and hi, Eric. Good to hey, meet hey. you. Hey, hey. Nice to meet you too. Yeah. yeah um, Oh, I, I got you guys live now. I was I had to delay for a while there. Oh, <laughs> how that happened? But anyway, that that's great. Hey, um, what's on your mind? Can you hear me? Oh, um, yeah, I've, I'm a longtime viewer, first time caller. I check you guys out on YouTube okay. mainly, and uh, and been watching you live here and there, and have been wanting to to get a chance to call in. I'm a uh, Let's see. I uh, grew up mainly as a, I don't know if we were atheist, but we didn't go to church much. My grandmother was Baptist, and um, I guess we went to Sunday school a little bit here and there, but pretty much not involved with uh, religion too much. When I was a teenager, my uh, mom and I um, looked into uh, paranormal type things, Um went to the Church of Religious Science, which oh, is actually, it's not, it has nothing to do with Scientology. I don't know if people know it. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with it, so I have no preconceived concepts. Yeah, it it's, uh, sort of encompasses all religions. and okay. um, So you have kind of a diverse uh, background. Yeah, okay. yeah. And uh, so there was a, when got read by a psychic, and we heard, things about how uh, there's different um, religious guides in different parts of your body and this kind of thing. And 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 so but whether I believed it all, I'm not sure exactly. But, you know, I had nothing disproving it. So, you know, I, I sort of took it for what it was worth. And then um, when I was around um, 28, I had an interesting experience that sort of went on when a went along with a manic episode. Oh, okay. If I can say that, but uh, yeah, you can. Can actually, I before you before you go on? Was this the first yeah. time you experienced a manic episode? Kind of, yeah. Because that's yeah, pretty rare to to get hit with that, you know, as a one off when you're almost thirty. Yeah, and and the one after that wasn't until ten years later. So that's. Okay. That was also new. Do you, I mean, I don't want to get to, you don't have to get into detail or anything, but do you think that there might have been like a life situation that maybe triggered this? Like, could there have been a particular stress or something that happened? Because it's really Not odd for that really. to just it, happen. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it had a little bit to do with meeting a particular person who... Okay, okay. all right. So, so there, there were some things and, going uh, on. Okay. Yeah, and... Um, and it always, they always seem to go with uh, having luck with meeting women, <laughs> too, here okay. and there. Okay, okay. And um, so, uh, so there are various triggers. I, I've looked at them through the years. Okay. Hopefully I'm done with them now because a lot of bad things have happened. Okay. I, I, I just wanted to look so. at that a little bit before you got into it because you were tying this in with, a, with something else that occurred concurrently, right? Um, yeah, or, or just sort of my general outlook. Um, I, I mean, at that time, I read this book, um, metaphysical book, 
which, I mean, that was actually one of the triggers, kind of. And it was one of these, um, uh, what do you call it, um, when it's being read in the first-person uh, channeled type books and from an angel-type being. Okay, so somebody was writing the book on behalf of, a, of some sort of divine agent. Yes. Okay, yes. I got gotcha. you. And it's called Starseed Transmissions. I'm not sure if you've heard <laughs> Okay, no, but it Ken, sounds Ken like Carey. I would expect. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, Ken Carey is the author. Anyway, okay. I've, his stuff, I don't know, I love his stuff, actually. Okay. But, um, but um, what that talked about is um, mankind sort of being a conduit between the spiritual aspect, of course, the one you can't see, which I know you guys talk about. A lot, and that's one of the things you argue against, and uh, but and then um, and then physical aspect, which is the world and rocks and mankind and the rest of it, and uh, there's various reasons why that kind of makes sense to me, and and uh, and so I've, like I say, I. It, it also I did this little book. It sort of fit in in a way with all. Religion sort of explained the whole thing. It was like a eighty-page book, <laughs> so that part was interesting to me too. Okay. So, uh, anyway, um, what I have ended up calling myself, I kind of did some notes before I called here. Okay, good. I, I'm, I'm calling myself a metaphysical agnostic. Okay. Because um, yeah, they put I, you down uh, as a theist. <laughs> Shame on yeah, the control I, I, room. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I, <laughs> I guess I, we don't I, have I a code I, for I, metaphysical agnostic. Well, well. I what I did say that there appears to be a divine plan behind things going on, and uh, what makes you think that? Uh, um, various things. Let's see. As I was listening to the other guys, so, uh, like, what I, is the I'll, what I'll is the plan? Any. Where are we going with this? Like, like ultimately, what is the plan here that we need to know about? The, the, the plan would be for um, the world to turn into a better place, something towards what you might see in a Star Trek world. I'm for that. You know. Well, I'm for that it, too, we'll, but I'm not sure that. observing the world that I'm seeing that plan really working. Oh yeah, I mean the things are rough. I, I, I agree with that. <laughs> so where is where is it? If I look at the world, I see it. I see this plan happening. A divine, the I see the divine work that is creating this plan in the White House, or you know, where is this manifesting the, the better world? Um. Well, let's see. I, I sort of thought about that a little bit. Because we got a lot of issues with ISIS going on. We have, you know, I mean, now don't get me wrong. I, I don't, yeah, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be the, uh, the world is about to end person, right? Because we'll get theists that call, and I don't want to sound like I'm flip-flopping here, where somebody calls and says, the world is so horrible. And I say, well, you know, we've, we've really cut down on slavery. We've really cut down on, you know, like women are, have a better place in many areas. And so I do agree that there are areas where you can point to it and say, hey, there are things that have improved. But what I guess I'm wondering is if, if that is sufficient to say, ah, clearly this is the work of a divine engineering as no, opposed you're, you're to people right. you're, 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 you're absolutely right i mean if you're going to look at things at face value and especially have how things have developed in the last 10 years it looks like we're going to hell pretty quickly and or, or something to that effect and uh <laughs> comrade and and and, and, uh, <laughs> and, and 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 yeah talking about isis and i, I don't know i mean i've i've been called a conspiracy theorist here and there you know, the chemtrails and who Can knows. Can I ask that. you something real quick? That, 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 have, you, you sound like somebody, you, 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 have, you read a lot, right? Yeah, well, a, a lot of it has been online okay. recently. I'm, but, that's still, but, 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 yeah, I'm going yeah, to yeah, let you have that. Paper. I mean, I have people that read ebooks and yeah. stuff. I mean, it's, paper's not what it used to be. So <laughs> do you, have you ever read any Joseph Campbell? Um, I, I'm aware of him, and, and okay. I've, I've also, uh, I mainly see his, his, some of his TV programs, but yeah, I think he's pretty oh, cool Oh, did you see the interviews with, um, 
Oh, no. I can't. Bill Moyers. Is it Bill Moyers? The, what, the, did he do? Uh, oh, Bill, Bill Moyers is one of my favorites. Yeah. Bill Moyers. And, and it was like, I think, a, a several-part series. But I may have the – I hope I don't have the, right, the wrong interviewer. But he did a really great, you know, several-episode thing with him. It was really awesome. Um, but Joseph Campbell and also Young, uh, Carl Young, the <laughs> psychologist mm-hmm. from way back, uh, both talk a lot about uh, concepts of dualism which it sounds like that's where your interest lies, right? You, you seem really interested in this sort of dualism, like the spiritual uh, and the physical, the metaphysical and the physical. Right. Okay. It, yeah, it, it goes across all, all aspects of being. I mean, there is evil and good and, and all that kind of thing. Well, Jung was interested in, and, and he had some interesting beliefs of his own, uh, and he was kind of interested in what it was about the mind that might contribute to the human experience that would make people view their existence in a dualistic fashion? Like, what was it about the way the mind worked that would create a dualist perspective in, in a brain? And it was, it's kind of too bad that he lived before current neuro, neuroscience because he had to work very much from just sort of observing behaviors and talking to people and asking about dreams and kind of getting this idea of what is conscious, what is non-conscious. And that's very yeah. difficult when you can't put an electrode on someone's head and really brain map that person. So he was working off of a lot of intuition based on observation, but it was still kind of interesting some of the things he came up with about how minds work, conscious and, and non-conscious thinking. Well, conscious thinking and non-conscious aspects of, of thought or brain. You know, like the idea of dreaming, for example. Like you're not conscious, but you're aware of a story that's happening right. and you're participating in it. And yet you're not conscious, but you're aware. And so there's all these levels kind of of consciousness that... Um, in some cultures, they consider those dreams to be divine themselves, right? Like they consider that part of dualism, right. that it's an interaction with the divine because you're not conscious and yet you're experiencing and seeing and doing. Uh, and so there are parts of the brain and things that the brain can do that give us this idea, uh, this experience really. It's an experience of duality, whether or not it's actually what we define it as, it's how we feel. So we have um, now science that shows that impulses in the brain to act happen before the actions are conscious. So our brain is triggering behavior, and then we become consciously aware of the thought of, I'm going to do this. So you can't see Eric Uh on the other side of the screen, but he just took a drink. And according to this research, the impulse to take that drink would have happened to Eric before Eric had the thought, I'm going to take a drink, right? So your brain is operating in a non-conscious mode, and then it's sort of relaying those things to your conscious brain, but since you are pretty much defining yourself as your conscious mind, you have these impulses coming to you from where, right? And so this can make people feel like, I'm getting these feelings and I'm getting these impulses, and where do they arise? Like, where are they coming from? Well, they come from your brain, but they... But you're not aware of it because they're not coming from conscious parts of your brain. And by the time your conscious brain becomes aware of it, that thing is already hit. And it seems like you thought of it, but you didn't. (laughs) So it starts in the subconscious. Yeah. And and so the other thing, though, what I think you might like about Campbell. So Joseph Campbell goes into the whole um, mythology of what you're talking about. So he looks at cultural myths and how they play into this idea of dualism, the idea of how we look at ourselves as both physical and non-physical, especially when you go back again before neuroscience, you have people who are working on just feeling and experience and observation, and they have this feeling of there's something else in my head that is going on when I'm dreaming, is going on before I'm having an impulse, is, you know, I I have these weird thoughts sometimes, I don't know where they come from, and I take these drugs and I have these bizarre experiences, and so all of these cultures have these different levels of consciousness that they are interpreting in different ways, and so you get these divine explanations of origins for these things or mythological stories about them, and I think that 
what you're describing is uh, there's a there's a saying from Campbell, and I'm I'm I think this is uh, pretty close to the quote is something like, "All religions are true, but none are literal." And I think people run into problems yeah, yeah, when definitely. right. So when they start to say this God or this hero or this angel or these things are literal, that's when they start miss missing the the message, which is usually a kind of deeper message about the human experience, right? I I would recommend, I think, if you're going into like metaphysics and, and doing this reading in metaphysics and people channeling and stuff like this, where they're kind of presenting almost the literal of it, it you sound like the type of person who can sort of look past the literal, because you keep saying things like, and I don't know if I really believe it, but whatever, I don't think. So I think you're not looking yeah. so much at the literal aspect of, oh, that is so cool that this angel wrote a book through this woman, as opposed to whatever she's saying about the human experience. And if you're there, there, in... There was one thing... Yeah, go, go. There, there was one thing... I was, excuse me, Tracy. Uh, no, please. Uh, that, that was coming up and then I made notes about, and, and when you're talking about subconscious and so on, I was thinking about, okay, how can mankind actually be this conduit between the spiritual and the and the physical? Well, okay, you look at what's going on, animals and the rest, you know, all the animals in the world, they sort of act on instinct and and they're in touch with sort of the subconscious, but not necessarily aware of it directly, you know, whereas man is more, you know, we obviously can um, um, deal with matter, you know, and, and transform matter into what we want and, and that kind of thing and, and are developing through advancements in technology more and more being able to develop things and so on. And and we don't, but we've lost some contact with the subconscious and our actual. Um, what am I saying? The, um, the way animals are naturally. Uh, oh God, I'm missing words. Can I the, try and help? Uh, it, instinctual. Instinctual. You know, we, we yeah, don't have. I mean, we do. I th I yeah. think that people operate more on instinct than they're aware of, and I think mm -hmm. that we are finding more and more that the conscious mind is may not be the driver's seat <laughs> that we think it is. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm kind of wondering if we, if, and this may be what you're saying, and it may not, you can correct me, but for me it almost seems like sometimes we sort of overthink the part that our conscious mind plays. We tend to give it more authority than it actually exercises in observed reality. Um, we attribute more to it than maybe it is actually causing. Um, what, what that, what's actually happening in, in real life? Yeah, I think our experience of being conscious may be creating the illusion in most of us or all of us that that consciousness is kind of driving. And, it's, and, it, and, the, and from an evidence standpoint, my understanding is that that's not necessarily what's happening in our heads in reality. Mm -hmm. We might be overanalyzing our experiences as, as animals. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I mean, to be truthful, I, I've, I, I have I haven't always or lately I I I don't think too much about this uh, being the conduit between <laughs> uh, spirituality and yeah. so on and it's not that I necessarily practice you know I do I will meditate you know yeah. and I and I, and I believe yes there's probably aliens or who knows where they came from maybe they <laughs> yeah. came through time I, time portal or something like that yeah. there's angels here, here and there <laughs> and i've had experiences what one of the things is when i'm on a manic trip there's a, a what i've what i've sort of termed as an accelerated synchronicity other people seem to be feeling the same thing and i have uh, had that experience on drugs as well but when i'm on drugs i'm not sure that that experience you know what i mean that's another thing where it's like i'm not sure i can trust my conscious recollection or experience at that point 
right? <laughs> I mean, and, 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 and overall, when you talk about evidence of, you know, so, something like a divine plan, um, one of the keys has been rock and roll and the Beatles and other groups and how they okay. sing about such things. <laughs> all right. About how... You know, we're all going to be in a. I just, I, I guess what Nirvana I would, what I would say is, I would appeal to people before they take, they go literal with some of these things to consider that maybe they're taking a metaphor too far. That would be my, yeah. Uh, what do you call it? My one recommendation, or if I had to offer a suggestion, um, that would be it. It's like there, there are interesting aspects to what they speak about in a in a symbolic way but when we start to take them literally it's almost like when people get angry if someone burns a flag without seeing the irony that the flag <laughs> represents the freedom to burn the flag right so they they get more yeah. hung up on the symbol as a literal thing you burn the flag than they do the the idea of the freedom that it represents and so i think it's important that we try to not get too literal with some of these symbols Right, and I wouldn't call myself a literalist, and certainly not that. And I'm, uh, but uh, I, let's see. I had a couple of stupid questions here, which uh, I'll just throw out at you to sort of try to round it up here. Yeah, because um, we are running out of time here, and I've got a few more callers. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. Um, is it you guys' intention to be, to recruit people into atheism? Into a what? Is it you guys' intention to recruit people into atheism? I wouldn't categorize what I do that way. I think for me, it's about asking people to consider their perspectives and to ultimately become the driver in their life, right? So I want people to get their lives, to, to, yeah. to control their lives. And whatever that means, to them, they may go their whole lives and never become an atheist, but I would at least, if I could get them to start thinking or questioning or examining that. Um, to me, the idea that if, if they, for example, rejected a god, but they did it for really horrible reasons, I wouldn't consider that, you know, like a win. That to me would be a fail. Does that make sense? So yeah. it's, it's not, the, it's, you know, yes, I think that the ultimate outcome would be atheism if you were following the paths of the most reasonable thinking. That's my perspective, obviously, there's people who disagree, but my goal wouldn't be, you know, if I had a magic wand and I could just, ooh, you're all gonna be atheists now, that would kind of defeat the purpose of wanting them to reason for themselves. Right, right. Okay, yeah, I, I know you've answered the question before and I was just sort of throwing that one out there. Um, the other part is, yeah, I'm not so sure I guess in some ways you might be able to call me an atheist, but um, would you think that modifying my agnostic point of view towards one that were like atheism, atheism would be worthwhile? Not necessarily like I'd want to do it. Well, but. I'm not sure what, what your agnostic perspective is. Yeah, the, those, those aren't mutually exclusive. Um, there are people who identify as agnostic atheists. Yeah. And so it may be that oh, okay. yeah. you could st say, I really don't know the answers to these questions. Um, I don't believe yeah. a God exists, but, you know, if one is presented to me, I will accept it as real. Um, most atheists would identify that way. Okay, well, that's cool. Um, <laughs> just real quick here. It's super cool. Um, I, 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 all right, last I, I watch one. you guys all the time. Uh -huh. uh, I watch you guys all the time, and uh, I, uh, I I know that, you know I'm, I agree with you that you know the Bible has all kinds of bad stuff in it, and and people that follow that and so on need to be kind of aware of that. But um, it seems like a lot of times you'll come up with arguments with Christians, and same points are recycled again and again and again. And it'd be nice if to hear more stuff uh, about um, speaking with uh, maybe Buddhists or Hindus. Or we'll Judea take anybody that calls. People. If you have friends that are Buddhists and you'd like to <laughs> suggest that they call in, please feel free. Uh, we, we pretty much and, talk to people, anyone who calls. Uh, and lastly, your caller before the last, God bless Paul. The poor <laughs> kid was having issues. <laughs> 
All right, well, we're going to put you on hold, not hang up, because I have gotten the answer on the hold thing, and they said some of these calls I need to put on hold, so I'm putting you on hold. Um, we're done talking to you, but the, the, the call screener may want to talk to you a little bit. All right? Okay, cool. Thanks, Chris. So great to talk to you, okay. finally, Tracy. I'm All definitely right. a fan. Bye-bye. Bye. Good to meet you again. Take oh. care, Chris. Or okay. <laughs> You're going to have to jump in, because I'm talking too much. Well, um, well, then I'll jump in really quick. Okay. Um, I have a different uh, view. I don't think we're trying to um, convert oh, yeah, yeah. people to atheism, right? Okay. Uh, because I don't think that really has a lot of structure to it. There are a whole bunch of atheists that I have everything else not in common with that we just would not get along. Sure. Um, but what I would say is that the more we can shrink the influence of religion the more we can remove an edifice that a lot of wrongs are committed under. And so the, I, I think one more place that we can take away um, pedophiles who, who get shipped off to places and, and avoid extradition, uh, people who prey on, on, on the weak and the elderly for money, you know, people on fixed incomes, um, and extort others that way. Mm -hmm. I think that... Um, if we can do that, like if we can just help bring that down just a little bit, you know, and help inform people just a right. little bit more, I think that I would be. Let me just ask, though, I mean, would you say that, for example, if I were able to, there's a person who's, you know, I love my church, I love my God, I love my pastor, I love my mm -hmm. family, we all go to church all the time, we're at the bake sale and we're at the, you know, whatever. If we can get that person to begin to look at pieces of their life as things that they maybe should start driving. Like, well, why do you accept this? Why, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you, and get them to start thinking about that. Wouldn't that person, as, as they begin to gain more control over their life, the, then other influences that are controlling their life would start to wane, right? I mean, it's like an economic pie. I can't start taking back pieces of my life and taking, taking control of it and still have somebody else controlling it. I'm taking that control back from somewhere. And so when that comes back, when that pastor is caught doing something wrong, yeah, you know, at the youth group or whatever, well, that person would be more likely to say, wait a minute, I'm not gonna automatically support the pastor than somebody who is just whole hog into, you know, buying into it lock, stock, and barrel. Hopefully. I mean, that's... I, 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 wanna, I wanna contribute to that. Right. Just, I, I take a look at, uh, like, Paul, for example, right? I mean, he talks about lukewarm, but when I was a Christian, I was on fire. Oh, yeah, yeah, me too. And, I mean, I was, I was in it. Yeah. And the culture around that is, um, was staying away from secular things. It was staying out of the influence of God. It was shame. Oh, my gosh, shame. He was talking mm -hmm. about 12 years old getting, in, get, getting into the church. But when I was 12 in the church... All of the boys were starting to go through puberty, and they were really shamed about what was going on in their pants. Oh, I can't even imagine. And, I mean, that was a way to just double down and sink in. And so I, I, I agree that exposing them is one thing, but I, I also just want to tack that on. I don't think it's against what you said. I think that just tacks on nicely. The more we oh, yeah. expose I, I, them. That's what I was saying. I think that, that those things just follow along. And uh, just to note, um, shame... I want to just talk about shame for just a moment. Shame versus guilt. Shame uh, is an emotion that you attach to yourself. When a person feels shame, they feel shamed of themselves, not of what they've done. And they will try to hide, right? So when you're ashamed, you try to hide yourself, hide things you do. When you feel guilty, you feel like this is eating away at me and I need to tell someone what I've done. So guilt is more about a desire to expose it and not hide it, right? It drives that sort of, I have to tell. Whereas shame is more about, I'm just gonna keep hiding it. And, and shame gets very toxic because when you start hiding something that you think is a problem or that is a problem, it may or may not be. You can be ashamed of things that really aren't a problem. But yeah. if you're ashamed of a thing, you won't talk about it. You won't go get help. You won't, uh, you know, you won't get support because you're busy trying to pretend that it's not happening and convince everybody else that it's not happening. You know, it reminds me of a story I remember about a young woman that had an eating disorder. And she was very ashamed of it, and she was an exchange student staying with somebody that I knew. And when they would have dinners, she would barely eat. And they would say, you hardly eat. Like, 
Are you sure you're not hungry? Are you sure you don't want any more? No, no, no. Well, one evening when this young woman was clearing the plates, as she did as a regular thing, mm -hmm. the host mom went into the kitchen and saw her just gorging on the leftovers, like just gorging. And when she saw that somebody saw her in this situation, she was horrified and ashamed. And the host mom was like, you don't have to feel bad. You're allowed to eat as much as you like. But that's the thing. It was about her internalized shame. It didn't matter that the people around her didn't care how much she ate. Like, eat as much as you like. We don't get, nobody's going to judge you for it. But she's judging herself, right? For whatever reason, she's ashamed of this disorder and that she was caught in this. And it just, you know, obviously made her feel horrible. And this is the, the thing. It's like you, you can't get help when you're hiding it. And this is part of what makes shame so toxic is that it's just going to destroy a person and they're going to be hidden away somewhere being destroyed. So shame is really bad. Yeah. And if you think you're experiencing it or feeling it, try to find a space where you can understand that you're, you're not bad. You're not a bad person. Whatever it is that you think you did or you think is wrong with you, um, it doesn't get better by hiding it, you know? And there's some things that are so hard to come out with, some things that society does judge that if a person were to come out, they would be hit with horrible judgments and treated horribly. And I think that we have to kind of check that because there's some things, if we think they're that bad, maybe we need to start behaving in a way that allows the people who suffer with that to come forward instead of having to hide, right? I mean... You know, I think the Facebook group for the Atheist Experience is going to be talking about our cultural taboos that we don't talk about for a while. I think that's a really great topic. Yeah, there's a lot of... I mean, if a, if a child is having impulses that they know are not going to be acceptable, um, and they're not going to come forward, and, they, and if they do come forward, they're going to be treated horribly for coming forward, uh, we're kind of creating monsters. Yeah, so we need to not be doing that. <laughs> anyway, okay. I'm gonna, we're going to go to, let's see, we have a minute call that, that had some trouble with the line, but we'll see how that's working. And I'm going to say, let's go with Dave in Montreal. Hey, Dave, can you hear us? Hello? Ooh. Or Alan. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it, it says Dave in Montreal on line five. Is that incorrect? Well, I'm from Montreal, but I'm not Dave. Okay, well, if you're Alan, we'll take that. Yeah. Um, let me just say they've got two topics here, and I'm going to say based on time, let's just pick one. Pick your favorite. Well, the slavery ar argument is actually very short. It's like, uh, basically, if you guys have seen, like, um, Schindler's List, right? I have yeah. seen Schindler's List. So I was thinking, um, if, if uh, somebody like Schindler, right, was uh, back in uh, times where slavery was acceptable or the law, uh, they could enslave somebody to keep them away from other, more dangerous slave owners. Do you think that that's an... It, it, I'm, I, just, just to clarify, is that... I think what he's basic... I don't think I don't think that that's an argument in favor of slavery. Um, that's an argument that says slavery is wrong, but if you had to work within a immoral system where slavery happens and people were going to die if you didn't enslave them, it's almost like two wrongs can help people in that situation. I don't think it makes slavery moral. I think it means that slavery is immoral, but if you had to work in a slave system and this was a way to help people who would otherwise be killed or treated more badly, um, yeah, it's almost like saying that um, if somebody has gangrene, right, of their leg and it has to be amputated, I wouldn't call the amputation great, <laughs> like a good thing. It's not a good thing that your leg had to be amputated. It's just better than dying from gangrene, right? Right, and that's, that's all that I was presenting. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I just want to make it clear because what they said was that you were arguing for the morality of slavery. Well, I mean, that's like the broad topic way of presenting it, right? Yeah, I wouldn't call that an argument for mor for the morality of slavery. I'd call it an argument for better or worse situations that include an immoral system of slavery. Yeah, I think we can both, we can all agree that slavery is still immoral, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Oh, okay. okay. All right. <laughs> so... Um, if, if, do I have time for the veganism argument, which is like 
<sighs> we can see. I mean, this looks like a long one, but um, we might hold it over for another time, but if you want to lay it out. Okay, I'm just going to lay it out. Um, basically, um, I I'm assume some people uh, listening are um, have that uh, sort of morality where they, they say, if everybody does it and it doesn't make sense, therefore that would be immoral. Like, um, what is it, like Kantian ethics, sort of? Yeah, there's the idea that if everybody did this, it would be very bad, and so it's best if we don't do this. Exactly. So um, <laughs> veganism would be like uh, not eating, not... Um, it's okay, Eric. What do you, how do you call it? <laughs> it wouldn't be uh, um, participating in an unsustainable um, industry, which is like the, uh, the agricultural industry, because it's like... Uh, more money, uh, it's subsidized than a, a bunch of other stuff, right? And it's um, environmentally unfriendly. Okay. It's un environmentally unsustainable. So is my so car. Yeah, but I mean, if everybody drove it, wouldn't that be immoral? If everyone drove, it would be immoral, would it? It's not environmentally sustainable, right? So basically... So like should I give up my car? To... Am I immoral for owning a car and using it? Well, if it's unsustainable, then yes. But okay. if it's sustainable, then no. Okay, so then basically all of our modern technology would be ha out the window, correct? We wouldn't have a home would it, with I an mean, air conditioning heater, like all of that. I mean, would it? If you're... Yeah, because if, if, if 7 uh, billion people on the planet or 9 billion, or, I mean, we're heading for 9 billion in 2050, if we all start living uh, in, you know, three-bedroom, two-bath homes with heaters and air conditioning and... Yeah, we're going to see some some massive impact on the planet. The only thing that's that's not doing that is that right now a lot of the planet doesn't live in the way that I do in the U.S. Yeah. Right, but that means it would it's not immoral. Uh, it is immoral. It would be immoral, is what you're saying. Yeah. So here's a question: Is the population going up a problem? Is that sustainable? Um, I mean, I don't know. I, I I've heard the. Um, statistics that say that uh, the Earth can sustain like 27 billion people? Do we want to hit capacity? Is it moral to say we should just go till we hit capacity? Well, I mean, is it immoral for people to uh, to re reproduce? Is that it? Or I'm asking. I don't know. Is it is it moral to for the human race to produce? You know, to to increase. Population. I mean, we, we do, as humans, have a much bigger carbon footprint than a car. I mean, a dog has a bigger carbon footprint than a car, so... Should we not have dogs? I mean, this, well, I mean, to me, I, I, I just want to say, I'm playing devil's advocate, because this is not my, this is not how I define morality. But I do agree with you that there are people who do, and for them, I'm kind of like, I don't know how you would answer these questions, because it seems like almost anything is going to be a problem once you keep breeding. If we keep increasing the population, it's almost like crapping is going to be immoral at some point, right? Well, I mean, that, that's what I'm saying. I'm just saying that under that Look. particular ethic system, it, it would be immoral to not be vegan. Well, it's, it, I'm, and I'm saying there's a, almost, you could name almost anything that I'm doing day in and day out. Like this, produce, the production of this program from this studio is probably, you know, not a good thing if everybody did it. And, well, I mean, and, every, I don't and everybody the, the poops. I read the book. The show are unsustainable. What I'm saying, though, is if everybody did a podcast and everybody had this sort of setup going on with all of the equipment that we've got running all the time and the energy that we're using, I've got to say that if 7 billion people all did this, it probably would have a pretty big impact. So is the show immoral? Um, well, I mean, in, in that framework of ethics, yes, it is. Right? I, I don't know because I don't have that that's framework. Wrong. But but I mean, it seems like it if that's if we're taking it as a very simplistic thing. Um, but I, but since I don't subscribe to it, it's hard for me to you know kind of quote defend it. It's not that I don't understand the principle. I just don't know how it's how how a person if a person who really subscribed to that were sitting here, they might do a better job defending it. I don't know that I can defend it because my first thought is everything was is going to ultimately be a problem if we if we keep increasing the population. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a fair fact. That I'm just uh, <laughs> so it seems to me that if that if we it, one of the easiest ways to kind of deal with the whole thing would be to make sure that the population doesn't continue to increase, and that way we don't have to worry about the impact of all these other things. But that in itself would also be unsustainable, I think. In How that come? Framework. Because if uh, people just stopped. Um, I'm not saying people stop. I'm saying, what if we stopped 
increasing the population. Well, even if, if everybody but, stopped, wouldn't that be the most moral? Yeah, I mean, if people, if we went extinct, would that be the most moral thing? If we just basically said we're all just going to stop breeding and let the human race die, would that be the most moral thing? Well, it depends. Like, uh, but then there would be no yeah. carbon put footprint created by any human being. Should we let ourselves go extinct? I mean, there are people who have a voluntary human extinction initiative. This is actually a thing. Um, I personally don't think that there's a, a problem with it in that they're not, they're not saying go out and kill everyone. They're just saying, let's just let ourselves die out as a choice. Yeah. <laughs> right? I, 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 like, I'm, not, I'm not advocating that people just commit the, the genocide of the human race or whatever. Sure, I get but, it. And I, I don't think that that's what you're saying. But I don't know. Okay, but, so it, well, can we yeah. just put this down as interesting question and then I can yeah. let you go? Okay, <laughs> we'll let you go. Thank you for the interesting questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. I'll put you on hold. Talk Heathen has been playing <laughs> with vegan callers the last okay. couple weeks. We're, I think, or we're five minutes over, right? Six o'clock. Yeah. Okay. I think so. Um, and so we do have a few calls, and I'm going to say, oh, boy, we've got some, some that are going to go a little long here. I'm in it if you are. Uh, once clarification of okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna say for Jay in Modesto, your question looks more intense than we're gonna have time for at the end of the show, so you might want to try again. I do think we can rip through Joe and Luke, and Alan. some we just okay. So let's okay. go th let's go for Joe here real quickly. This is Joe in Vegas. Hi. Hey Joe, Hello. Tracy and Eric. And Hi, nice to speak with you finally, Tracy. Okay, before um, you wait, before you start, I, can I ask you something? The the screeners yeah. have put you down as religion has some good points. Why not use them? And I would say I'm fine with that. In fact, I have quoted scripture before uh, as as a positive. There are certainly positive quotes and aspects to cert certain yeah. things in there. I mean, so I, I think well, I'm I, on I, board I, with you. I don't think I'm arguing with you here. I I, I would say that there are some things in there that are nice, like love each other. And, you know, so there's some really good passages on love and on the idea of treating people um, as though you have, like they're your family, right? Like, who's my brother? Um, am I my brother's keeper? Well, who's your brother? And Jesus was like, oh, everybody. And I don't think that that's a bad idea, right? Right, I don't either. But it seems like a lot of times uh, when atheists, uh, you know, address um you know the issue of a re religion they fail to put it in its proper context of maybe literature and mm. is it the atheists that do that or are they responding to theistic claims i mean let's be fair right i mean um, when it when a theist comes i don't know i mean i've been an atheist okay. for for a while and i've heard a lot of, of folks just you know just get bitter and frustrated and, and kind of condescending and I think that we need to remember that a lot of people out there um, are not able to kind of grasp, you know, anything beyond the idea of a patriarchal, you know, old white guy with a beard sitting on a cloud as being, you know, what caused everything to come into being. And uh, we should probably be a little more gentle with these people at times and kind of remember Sure. Um, you know, that not everybody is in the same spot or has the same capacities. You know what I mean? No, I, I think it's fair to tailor your message to the person that you're talking to. Uh, yeah. I think that's totally fair. Right. And I subscribe to the different well, strokes. I mean, the reason approach. I... I mean, for me, right. I, I didn't start questioning until I heard something super offensive, you know, <laughs> and then I wanted to look it up mm -hmm. like, uh, that didn't get better. Um, and it, no, it, it just... It, 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 it's, there, there's kind of a spot for everybody, and there's also a mindfulness of there are a lot of atheists who do, when they step away from religion, they realize that they've been indoctrinated and in this place, and, and, and you, you, there's this idea of the angry atheist, but you know, I was furious when I found out that I've been getting lied to my whole life, you know, and, and, and in yeah. my experience, I see that you know, wither away a bit and, and, and you, you, you settle in and that anger kind of goes away as you start to um, realize that you're, you can still be a good person and start filling those gaps in, you know? Right, and I also, I also realize that there is a, you know, direct correlation between the level of piety someone aspired to and their level of bitterness having 
learn that they'd been had, you know. Sure, the more you um, invest in it, the it, tougher it is to figure that out. Right. Yeah. Especially for, you know, the forms of, we'll, we'll use Christianity as an example, uh, especially the forms that are, you know, what you would consider to be less mainstream, more uh, literal, you know, and I, you know, I just think that some of it's, some of that stuff out there is even offensive to people that you would be quote, you know, call quote unquote mainstream Christians. But I think that we would all do well to kind of just, you know, remember that these are stories and some of it, I mean, even qualifies as great literature without even having to invest anything into belief. Even if you look at it as a fairy tale, you know, uh, um, I, I, I think that's and, up to taste. I, I've read the Bible. Well, true. Yeah, true. It is I, a that's boring why some of it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it has cultural and historic significance. Right. I mean, it tells <laughs> us about um, in, in an altered way, like the times and and the people who were writing the ideas. It gives us an idea of what exactly. was important to them and what, you know, and sometimes it's pretty horrific and sometimes it can be inspiring. Um, but I think that I mean, when I think about people who are hammering the, the morality of the Bible, honestly, that mm -hmm. only comes up for me when someone comes to me to tell me about how moral their God is and how moral and wonderful their religion is. And then I start asking them about, you know, what's in their Bible. Yeah. It's not that I, that I look at it and say, oh my gosh, every word is toxic and dripping with poison. It's that this person is coming to me telling me every word is moral and wonderful and everyone should follow this. Yeah. And then I look right. at it and then but I have the to point the, out. The problem with those types of people are if, you took religion away, they would find something else to... I don't make, to I don't make that assumption, same. right? I don't make that assumption because I was uh -huh. one of those people, okay? And, and I'm not, I didn't, I didn't find something else. What I found was I don't need religion to tell me what to do, and I don't need anybody to tell me what to do. Well, well Tracy, I, find, I have a hard time putting you in the same category as Jimmy Swaggart or... Joel Olstein. I went somebody. to the Church of Christ, which is even, I mean, Matt yeah. had, a, had a debate with um, some members of the Church of Christ, and I kind of talked to him a little bit about it before he went down there, and his reaction when he came back was kind of like, these people are messed up far more than what you described. Like, yeah. it was not what I was expecting. Yeah. Um, they are well, you traveled literalists. Way then and, and good for you and good for us that you have. I mean, I enjoy, you know. But I'm just saying, I, do, I don't assume on. what yeah. person can and can't aspire to once they are free. It's almost like you have a person in chains and I have no idea what will happen when we break those chains. Right? I don't know what will happen. I just know I don't think it's fair for them to be chained. Right. And they have as and much right as I do to, to be free and to pursue their life. Yeah, of course, of course. But I just wanted to touch on a couple other things. You made two points earlier. One was about Joseph Campbell. It was Bill Moyers. Yeah, that thank did, you. I think it was the face, oh. the face of masks or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. The ma hero so, mask or like so, heroes. Like yeah, something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nothing. And then you were talking about how the brain works uh, to kind of drive you before you're even aware of it. And uh, as a neurology student, I watched actual videos of experiments um, where they would actually remove a piece of the skull <laughs> Fun. and they uh, yeah the um, it's on YouTube if you you know look it up on there I'm sure you'll be able to find it it uh, the guy can like watch chemicals move around in the brain and basically was able to predict what a person's responses were or what they were going to say or what oh, they were going to do. Oh, yeah, we're getting really good at, like, reading brains. I mean, we have now devices yeah. that can translate brainwaves into music or images, right? You show people images, and then you you ask them to remember the image, and the machine can right. recreate the image in a kind of rudimentary way from their memory of what they saw. I, Amazing stuff. I think even one of these people managed to create an out of body experience by manipulating. Yeah, I remember that one. Chemistry. Reading about that one too. Was that right. the God helmet? So, we, I mean, it kind of makes you wonder God, if we're I heading think, toward. I think it might have been. Yeah, he's just saying it if that was. It makes you kind of wonder where, you know, you were talking about ethics before. Yeah. Um, you know, how long is it going to be before we are 
cyborgs, you know, until there's interface and, and devices and genetic engineering and kind of, you know. I, I mean, I watched an interesting you know, show. I, I don't want to drag this out too much longer, but I watched an interesting show basically mm -hmm. saying that's going to be the next phase of human evolution is the, the human Absolutely. machine integration. That that's where it's going. Yes, um, it's I agree it's with an that interesting question. thought. Uh, you know, I, I'm ready for my cyborg body. Right, so. sign me up. <laughs> I think I think all of us are that uh, anticipates uh, going to sleep forever. <laughs> if we can get a little more time in to do some things we wanted to do, and maybe even do them a little better, you know. There you go. All right, we Joe. All, we all hope for that, right? Thank you for taking the call. Sure, and thank you. I appreciate thank you, your call. Bye. 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 Okay, and we're going to hit Luke here in Phoenix. Luke. Hi, Luke. Hey, how you doing? Okay, okay. good. I, I want to make sure I understand your question as it's put forward. Are you asking, what they wrote was that you want clarification of positive atheist thinking. Are you talking about the thinking of someone who identifies as a positive atheist? Or, I mean, can you clarify what well, it is you you're looking for? Well, you mentioned in the very beginning of the show that one of the purposes of the show is to promote positive atheist thinking. I said positive and atheist culture. Oh, so, oh, so what, what does that mean exactly? It means that we have people who are atheists, who many, many of whom are disenfranchised from religious cultures that they have been ostracized from, for example, where you're not allowed to be in that church anymore, you've been shunned, you've lost your family. Um, and so they look for other people who will accept them so that they can socialize because they're social creatures. And so we want to give them a positive experience of having other human beings with whom they can be friends and whom they can interact and build social supports just like everyone needs. And that's kind of my understanding of what I, that would mean. I, I, I would expand that to include people like we're talking about Phil. Um, I'm filling in for Phil and um, he's just a one person <laughs> charity machine. Yeah, he's a volunteer dynamo. <laughs> and, 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 and every time you see him, you're just like, what am I doing with my life? But he, if I were to find an example of positive atheist culture, I think he would be a living example of, of what that looks like because you don't need religion to do good things. And that, I, I, well, I would, just to, I want just to, to give a little context, Phil, who he's talking about, is also on the show sometimes, and he got our, he got a, an award, I'm I think, at the, that he knows, huh? Well, we got That's an award <laughs> at the, at the, he got an award at our last, like, annual Bat Cruise thing, I think it was, where it was, like, volunteer of the year or something, because Phil heads up what is called, like, the ramp, he heads our section or our little meetups for the ramp projects, which is to build ramps onto houses or buildings that need them um, for, pe for people with wheelchair access, right? And atheist then- Atheist helping the homeless. Yeah, he does atheist helping the homeless, and he does, so he devotes himself kind of to this, and he, he organizes and coordinates this between Austin and also in San Antonio. And this is sort of what he dedicates himself to when he's not working yeah. full time, so. And, and planting trees. <laughs> yeah, he's just- And cleaning highways. He's the he's talks. the sort of he's that sort of if you're looking for an outlet to do you know good charitable things he is there for that because a lot of people again lose that when they end up being ex you know excised from their religious culture and their religious society does that help you understand it? Oh yeah, it does, and I actually wanted to bring up like a clarification on something else. Okay. Don't you think it's a little interesting? You don't think it's a little interesting that athe that quote unquote positive atheist culture is basically dependent on Christian culture? I'm I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. Well, you're saying that they have to find a cult now that they've been basically shunned by the Christian community. They have to go find another culture, but their culture is basically directly coordinated to the Christian culture. These not at all, not at all, not at all, not at all. So, for example, I came from the Church of Christ, right? The Church of Christ did not do vol volunteer outreach. We didn't do any kind of volunteer, any kind of charitable work, nothing like that. It was that was supposed to be done by the individual Christian in their individual time, in their individual life they didn't coordinate it as a church. So my church didn't really do that. And so it's as far as what the, if a person is involved in a charitable culture, that can be religious or not religious. There are secular charities that aren't necessarily atheist related, right? There are charities that are involved with education and literacy that aren't religious or atheistic or anything. So charity is not owned by 
by the church, right? Charity is something ch some churches do, but charity is also something that some people do. And it's, and it's really exciting that you don't put those things together because that's something that was ingrained in me in the church was that that is what a Christian does. And when people would well, describe Well, you were a liberal Christian. Oh, no. <laughs> When I was, oh, but, 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 but the, the idea when people describe themselves and they talked about other people, oh, he's a good Christian person. Mm. And so a big yeah. piece of that for me, Luke, is saying, no, that's not necessarily the case. The, the reason we're bringing it up as positive atheist culture is because we want to show that you don't yeah. have to have God. And if there wasn't... People the, helping people is not... It, it, I'm, you can be involved in a religion and help people. But people helping people is a human thing. Whether yeah. you're religious or not, it's something people do because we're social animals. And, and we, we kind of have nothing to show that against except theism. I mean, if there wasn't theism, there wouldn't be atheism, right? I mean, that's just kind of what you're left with. So if so one went, the other would go too, and it would just be positive culture. Right. So if I'm hearing you correctly, Paul, like helping others and being charitable are moral imperatives in atheism. I'm not saying that it's a moral, moral imperative in atheism. What I'm saying is it's a natural human thing. And I'm saying that there are some atheists who are going to be really moved toward charity in the atheist community and some who are not. Mm -hmm. Some who just want to come to the pub night. Yeah, that's just an example. It's not a requirement for an atheist to do charity. It's not, you know, it's just, it's, it's available if they want to do it. It's about creating well, those opportunities for anybody that wants to pursue them. Uh, Phil is very, very in pursuit of those things. Yeah. Um, other people may do some of them and not others, and some people may do none of them. Well, look at the Secular Families Group. That's not necessarily yeah. a... Yeah, he was, uh, what was it? J Eric was talking earlier about the idea that, we're, that a ACA is gonna start a secular group for families because a lot of the people who are in the group currently um, either don't have children or are not inclined to sort of participate in a, in a family type thing. Like if you don't have kids, it's not that important to you. But if you do have kids, it's very important to you. Like, where do I go? You know, I can't, like he was saying, I'm not dragging my kid to the happy hour. Yeah. So um, they're looking for something to do. And so they're starting up a family group. This is nothing to do as far as I'm aware with, it's not like tied inherently to some kind of charitable yeah. effort, but it's just about having a place to go where your kids can interact with other children. Because like if you went, if you walked into a church building, there would be the daycare where you drop the little toddler off and then there's the, the, the little Sunday classes on the side for the different age groups, right? And you just hand them off and then you go in and, and do the big auditorium for the adults for a while and then you all come together. And so you have this sort of instant community that a church provides where people can just be like, oh, here's the shortcut, right? I can just join this church and boom, it's all taken care of for me. But people who are in an atheist community, we don't already have that structure in place. And so we have to look at it and say, well, no, it's not like instant you know, community here. We are people who are like, if you move to a new city, like Matt has said before, since he, when he was a Baptist, he could go to any city and all he had to do was go to local Baptist church and he had instant, instant social framework and, and social support because right there in. were churches everywhere. But there's not like an atheist church. I mean, there are some secular church models, but the, the atheism itself doesn't really require coming together on Sundays or coming, you know, there's nothing about that. So we are people who, we have the same human need to socialize and to want to help sometimes other people and to you know do all kinds of things, have families and whatnot. And so we don't have the, the little instant pill that bang, there's the church and here it all is. So we have to kind of do, do our own grassroots kind of thing. And the reason that the churches are set up as socially as they are is because of human need, right? You have the daycare because your church members have kids. So this is, it's built around what people need and what we, we're having to do is build something around what people need. Does that make sense? So, but I'm not suggesting, well, I'm not suggesting that you don't, obviously you don't have the accessible institutional structures that churches have. I'm just questioning the justification for the desire to say, oh, we, we do charitable work because that's trying to implies that in atheism, charity is a moral good that you should pursue. No, oh. I, I, not, I don't agree no. with that because no. not all atheists are involved in charity work. Some of them, there, oh, are, there are going to be some people who want to do charity. And for those people, it's good to have those charitable outreach 
efforts so that if that's what they're into and that's what they want to do, they can go and do that. And there's other people who are just like, I just need to have contact with other people sometimes and I want to go to happy hour on Thursday and brunch on Sunday and that's all I really need from the group. And nobody says, oh, you're a horrible, immoral atheist because you don't come do the ramp build. No. And, and, oh, so what, basically, the, so, so for the fulfillment of human need is a moral imperative and a moral good in atheism. I'm atheism not saying, why, wait, wait, wait yeah, it, it's not, there, it's not a moral imperative. It's just simply people are social by nature. And so most people, I mean, there are some people who don't like socializing, right? Who just say, I'm going to join ACA, but I really don't want to come to the stuff because I like just hanging out at home watching TV and ordering a pizza. But the, when you're asking about what is positive atheist culture, it's not positive atheist morality. We're not telling people what they have to do or don't do, and we're not judging them by which groups or which parts they participate in. We're just simply offering them things that people often express as needing as human beings with social needs, right? So sometimes they just want to have contact with other people. They might want to meet other people for a romantic relationship. You know, they may want to um, have an opportunity to do charitable work. They may just want to go somewhere where their kids can socialize with other kids outside of school. But it's not, I, I, I think you're a little bit too focused on this, the, this moral concept. But you, trend, but you basically, but you, but when I'm discussing this with you, you're basically saying that human, like fulfilling human needs is something that we as people should do and ought to do. I think that it helps people. I'm not telling anyone to do it or not do it. I'm just saying that you can create those opportunities if this is what you'd like to do. You seem super hung up on... I'm not telling people... The... And, and this is the thing. Part of what I was explaining to somebody earlier when they were asking, is my reason for doing this to convert people to atheism? And I said, my reason is just to give them their lives back and let them do it. And I used an analogy also with someone else where I said, it's like somebody's in chains. I'm just breaking the chain. I'm not telling them where to run to when I release them or whether they have to move at all when I break the chain. If that chain gets broken, it's up to them what they do with it. I'm not telling them what to do. I'm not doing shoulds here. I'm not saying we're breaking these chains and now we're going to tell you that you should do this and you should do that. I'm just saying I'm breaking the chain. You're a human being. You have the freedom now to make choices about your life and what you want to do and where you want to go with that. And it is not up to me to tell you that. You have to sort that out for yourself. It's your life. Yeah. <laughs> So, what she said. So, but, but, but the reason why I'm asking about the clarification of a positive atheist culture, because if atheism is not about morality and atheism is not about like, any kind of justification of saying what something is right or wrong or not, how can you say that you can produce a positive culture if there's no correlation to what is good or positive? We are offering, I'm not saying that something, we are offering things that people traditionally express that they would like. Right, that, that help them in their lives, that they want to do in their lives. I'm not making judgments about what those people are asking for. The people that have children, we were talking earlier about you know, the morality of if everybody did it, and I, I was suggesting maybe that it would be more moral if we weren't breeding, right? And I'm not telling people whether or not they should have kids, but I don't think there's anything wrong with having a group where the people who do have children can come together and let their kids have a play date. I'm not saying that people should do that. I'm saying that there are people who feel like they would really like to have it. And as an atheist group, we felt like there was a need for this. People were asking for it. Members were asking for it. So let's produce it. So there is no they have, having children inter, having children interact together having play dates are not necessarily good and not necessarily bad. Okay. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I I I really got to step in here. Um, okay. So what springs to mind is the Cy, Cy Ten Bruggen Kate kind of idea that um, because you don't have God, you can't make a decision on what is good or bad, what is moral or immoral, because you don't have that basis. I, 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 I want to clarify, is that what you're kind of, because it seems like you're more interested in the word good and positive, and then saying how can you tell that this is good or positive, when we're giving you every example that we have, but it doesn't really seem to, to, to stick or it doesn't I, I seem to be... I guess for me, I don't see these as moral issues. Whether or not somebody makes a group and lets the children come and have a play date or doesn't, I don't think they're moral or immoral based on that. I, I don't understand how this would even be a moral question. It's just simply something that people want. It makes them happy. It doesn't harm people. And so it would be provided because it meets a need. 
that people have expressed as a need. That's all it is. It's not about telling people what they should or sh whether or not they should bring their kid. If you don't bring your kid to the play date, you're immoral. I'm not telling them that. And I'm not telling them, you know, you have to, you, you shouldn't bring your kid to the play date. It's like, the, bring your kid to the play date, don't bring your kid to the play date. It doesn't matter. Some people want to have this play date group, and so we made a play date group because it makes some people happy. And that's up to them if they take, if they didn't take advantage of it, we'd cancel it. If it turned out nobody showed up, you know, for the next 10 play date groups, they'd probably say, yeah, this did, we thought there was a need, but there's not. And, and just stop it. it. I don't think it would be good or bad. It would just be people wanted it, made them happy. The other people didn't want it, you know, they, it, whatever. But, they, it, but these aren't moral questions. And if they wanted to call it positive atheism... It's positive in the sense that people have asked for it. It yeah. tends to make them happy. This, this side group over here wants this thing, and so we're providing it for them. Because providing things that meet people's perceived needs generally is positively perceived. <laughs> if you have a need and somebody meets that need for you, you're usually like, hey, that's very cool. Thank you. But these aren't but moral questions. But if you don't have something that has, if you hold to a philosophy that denies the existence of intrinsic value or moral purpose, I told you, you I, knew oh, I knew it. I knew it, Eric. No, this I isn't. Told but, you. but these aren't questions of morality, right? These aren't moral questions. I mean, what you're what you're doing here is you just put us through, I don't know how many minutes of useless discussion because you would not come out with what your point was. And the, Why the, did you do this whole sideline thing of what is, po if you have, if this was your question, why the hell didn't you ask this right up front instead of wasting the time that you did at the end of this show? And really, if you're gonna have the, your conclusion from the beginning that we can't be moral creatures or have <laughs> that, that kind of uh, decision-making ability, then if you've already come into it with that decision, why should we care what Wait, you have to no, say from I, here? I'm beyond that. I'm beyond that. What does your morality say about dishonesty? When you come on and you ask about this positive atheist culture, and you're basically trying to set up this framework of, oh, I'm going to spring this trap. This is a trick question. I, I took your call because you were asking, what is positive atheist culture? And I thought, this is a simple thing to explain to a person. The problem is it's not a simple thing to explain to a person who is being dishonest and calling for dishonest reasons and doesn't really want to know the answer. This was a fact, right? Or a, what is it? Jacking off, J-A-Q, just asking questions. <laughs> you didn't really want an answer to this question. You wanted to make a point. But instead of making an honest point, you asked a freaking question that really wasn't relevant and really was just just a distraction to kind of try to get us to loop us around so that you could ask, say what you really wanted to say because you really didn't give a shit about what the answer was here and that is a waste of the show's time. I don't appreciate that kind of dishonest question when, it, when you're really trying to make a point. Next time you call, make your freaking point. The end. Yes. Uh, before we end out, I just want to say- We're going to Star of India. <laughs> After the show, please come and join us. And I'm taking off my headset. And like, oh, also, um, like and subscribe. Um, there are a whole lot of people who watch that don't, and uh, you should like and subscribe. And if you like that, also check out Talk Heathen and our other sister shows. Um, Godless Bitches is coming back. Um, the Nonprofit and um, Twenty Nine West Anderson. Yeah, the come bottom. see us live when you see can. The crawl. We're going, yeah, we've got all kinds of stuff. And there are announcements that you can go and access. Um, like I said, I've got links to either. Well, I've got to add the link, I think, to Talk Heathen. It may or may not be up there. I have to check. There you I go. I would like that very much. I'll see. I may already have added it, <laughs> but we'll see. Anyway, visit the blog, and uh, we'll have the, the show thread there. Sounds good. And we're going to dinner. Thank you, crew, so much. Thank you for everybody. Thank everybody you, audience. Back. Yeah. Peace out. Yeah. <laughs>